Hello and welcome to the third of five talks about vitality. The topic today will be personal vitality, by which I mean the zest or aliveness that makes us feel enthusiastic about meeting our days with creativity and purpose. So this personal vitality is the sort of vitality that's most consciously available to us. It's, it's what we're most aware of. It is related to the sexual vitality discussed last time. For one thing, none of us would be here were it not for sexual urges and sexual activity that led to the pregnancy that produced us. But in addition, there is a sense in which the zest of life for continuing forward from generation to generation is also the zest which keeps us moving forward from day to day. So we can see the exuberance of life, I think, on display in the sexual secretions of these two sea biscuits. They're related to sea urchins. The male is on the left and the female on the right. And we saw these videos last time to make a similar point, that there is a lot of vitality inherent in sexuality. And some of that feeds into our day-to-day -day personal vitality. Talking about vitality has several times brought up this concept of flow, of how important it is for us to meet life with a sense of flowing, moving from one experience to the next with ease and grace. But flow is a much more general principle that we can see everywhere in our lives and especially in our bodies. So for instance, the heart is an organ of flow, right? It, it creates blood flow, it pumps specifically to move blood around the body to make it flow. Now we can support the health of the heart by actually moving and making use of its flowing capacities. So the more we push the heart to pump blood by exercising vigorously, the more we actually support it to grow stronger and more effective in its action. So there's a kind of two-way street going on here, a mutuality where we can support the flow by being active and the flow that the heart creates permits our activity. There's also flow in the lungs. You know, there's air flow in and air flow out with every breath. The lungs are strengthened by aerobic exercise or even light uh, activity, just like the heart. In addition, there are specific exercises, particularly in the yoga tradition, that help improve the efficiency and help us become more mindful of the breath. The digestive tract, too, is all about flow. We take foodstuffs in through the mouth and they travel through the tube that goes from mouth to anus and then eventually the race waste products exit the other end. Along the way, there are lots of digestive juices that get added. All of this stuff, all of this material flows through the body and our sense of vitality clearly has a lot to do with intestinal flow. We feel discomfort when there is constipation or diarrhea when the flow is not optimal. We can support the health of the digestive tract by eating high fiber plant-based diets to the extent that that's possible or comfortable for us. We can also support our digestive system simply by being a little calmer and not multitasking while eating. The brain is another organ of flow. I mentioned this in the first session when I referred to the work of Dan Siegel, the psychiatrist who describes the brain and mind as a joint system of energy and information flow. We can support the flowing ability of the mind and brain by exercising, in this case, learning new tasks even late in life. For instance, it's been shown that people that, you know, take up new languages or start to play musical instruments late in life can protect themselves from cognitive decline to some extent. Mindfulness, which is a big part of this class, can also support the ability of the brain to flow. 
So all of these supportive activities that we can undertake to help our body feel more vital and more flowing. You, this doesn't need to be a dedicated meditation practice where we sit every day, that's certainly helpful. More important though is just to kind of be tuned in to the flowing quality in our blood flow, our breath, our digestion, and our you know, thoughts and feelings and experiences. All of this flow, the more we're in touch with it, the more we release into it and relax and allow it to move us forward, the more we'll feel vitalized. Another dimension of flow, of course, is the flow of a life through time. All of these life stages. At one point we were a little fetus inside the womb, and at a much later point, hopefully, we'll be a corpse in a tomb, right? That's the fate or the gift of human life. And in between, there are many stages that we go through. And we have to learn to let go from one stage to the next. This is really key to flowing forward, is letting go of the past. Early on, the decision to let go is not really conscious. The little infant probably isn't deciding to exit the womb, but it experiences a sense of change and it has to let go of this beautiful communion with the mother's body as the baby grows up a little bit and begins to crawl and, and then stand and then say a few words here and there, the little human has to give up the passivity of infancy for a little more activity. Shortly afterward, the child begins to encounter rules. There's no longer this sense of I can do whatever I want. I'm an autonomous you know, being. Now all of a sudden I have to respond to the demands and requests of other people. Then the child heads off to school and gives up the idea of life is all about play and fun. Now I have to buckle down a bit. And then we enter adolescence and all of a sudden there's a kind of loss of innocence as the hormones get stirred up and all these sexual urges arise. And we enter young adulthood and we have to give up the idea that someone's going to take care of us. We have to find our own way. Middle age comes and we start to realize we're giving up options left and right. Whereas when we were young, we might have thought we could do anything we wanted. Now we realize our you know, choices are much more limited. And then we enter old age and we start to have to give up some power. First the physical power of the body, but then maybe we retire and we lose the power of being in the workforce and we lose some financial power. And then eventually we have to give up life itself. So there's this letting go, letting go, letting go, which enables life to flow forward. And doing it skillfully and with zest and vitality is the art of moving forward, letting go along the way. So flow is really the art of moving forward, at least as it applies to a human life through time. And I want to illustrate some of this by a specific example using a metaphor. And the metaphor is going to be a sailboat. And I have a little bit of experience sailing boats. I don't consider myself a sailor per se, but it's a fun metaphor for me to work with. Now, it's pretty easy to understand how a sailboat could move in the direction of the wind. If the, the wind is blowing behind the boat and it moves forward. That's not difficult to understand. It's sort of expected. It can be a little more counterintuitive when the boat sails, say, at a 90 degree angle to the wind or when it actually starts to sail a little bit toward the wind. And the boat can usually sail up to about a 45 degree angle off the wind. Now, it can't sail any closer to the wind than that. It can't sail directly into the wind as indicated by the pink triangle in this image. There's a so-called no-go zone. But that doesn't mean we can't head upwind. We can, we just need to zigzag back and forth to get there. That's enough for us to know about sailing for me to move on to the specific example I mentioned, which is my own life. I'm going to tell a little bit of my own life story, not because it's especially interesting, but because it's something I know well. Okay, so in my life, I started out as a young person around age 20, nearing the end of college, pretty focused on building up status. I had had some academic success once I got to college, not so much in high school, but once I got to college I was doing well and I started to notice that people gave me a little bit of status for having good grades or whatever and I wanted more of that. I also had a good friend who was very popular and kind of had a magnetic personality and I decided I wanted to be popular too. 
And I also found myself kind of changing majors and you know, changing directions fairly frequently. And I had this feeling that I really liked to have a lot of novelty in my life. And so those became my guiding lights, and I started to kind of head in those directions, and it was difficult. I managed to make progress. I did go to medical school and become a surgeon and so on, but it always felt kind of laborious, like I was tacking against a strong headwind, trying to make that headway, uh, but it wasn't easy for me because I was in a competitive environment, I don't have a personality that's very outgoing, and uh, I get anxious easily to deal with all the competition and the limitations of my introversion and my anxiety with those values, uh, it became harder and harder and eventually things just kind of blew up when I was about 40. And uh, my career came to an end because of all sorts of health issues including some psychiatric ones and shortly afterwards after everything exploded I found myself being kind of blown in the exact opposite direction from where I thought I wanted to go. I was losing status at a rapid pace, I was living a pretty isolated life, and uh, there was a lot of sameness. And it, I, I kept trying to turn it around and go back to my old mode, but just kept being unable to. could sustain it for a little while and then I'd lose my grip and be blown downwind again, so to speak. Well, eventually I started to notice that, you know what, I actually don't care that much about status. It's much more important to me to act as an equal among equals. I have a, place a high value on equality in the largest sense of the word, that people are fundamentally equally valuable no matter their individual position or skills. I also notice that I really prefer solitude to being around lots of people. And I also admitted to myself what had been pretty obvious all along, which is that I feel a lot safer and more comfortable when things are stable. And once I began to accept my authentic values a little more, I found my way fairly efficiently to doing the work I now do, which I consider to be my life's work, that I couldn't have found if I hadn't gotten more in touch with who I truly am. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I have the opinion that it's always best to do what comes most naturally to us. I think we have to weigh a number of factors. So there are certainly times when people work against their capacities in order to pursue something of higher and more abstract value. Like a person may hold a job that's draining and unsatisfying because they're serving the higher purpose of getting their kids through college. Or timid people that are relatively frightened of being hurt might put themselves in a dangerous situation to make a stand against injustice. So the important point isn't that we should always do what comes most naturally, but that we should be aware of what we're doing and the values that are driving our choices. And sometimes the value will be, you know, what do we innately feel most comfortable with? And sometimes the value will be something that's at a little higher and more abstract level uh, where we actually have to feel some discomfort in order to achieve whatever it is we think is important. But mainly the point here is to be aware of what we want on the deepest level and who we are in terms of our capacities and temperament. It brings up this line from Carl Jung, the privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. And to the extent that we can get in touch with who we truly are, I think we will begin to feel more and more and more in touch with a deep well of vitality. The issue can come up, how do we find our way? Especially when I was younger, I didn't really have any good guiding light or compass to go by. So I was mostly listening to my peers and to the culture at large. And so that's why things like status and popularity seemed important. If I had listened more to my inner feelings, to what I was experiencing in my body as I made some of the choices that I made, I probably would have slowed things down and maybe headed in some different directions. Because if I had listened to my deeper intuition, I don't think I would have put so much emphasis on status and so on, which kind of went against my nature. So, but for me to connect with that, I had to connect with my body first. Well, that sounds good in principle, to connect with the body, and certainly meditation can help. And that's a big point of this class, is to bring us more in touch with our interior so we can develop more intuitive responses. But I have to keep 
in mind in my own case, and, and I think this will be true for uh, many viewers, that some of us have a lot of trauma in our past. And in this uh, well-known book by Bessel van der Kolk, another psychiatrist called The Body Keeps the Score, he makes the point that as we experience trauma, even if we don't dwell on it or even remember it, uh, it's, it's housed in our body and affects how we feel, it affects our health. And uh, when we start to tune into the bodily interior, if we have much trauma in our past, we're going to encounter some of the residue of that. We'll feel agitated or frightened or have bodily pains and so on. So the message here would be to go very slowly and compassionately as we feel in and not be too surprised or alarmed if some painful memories and feelings come up and to not push through them, but to take breaks whenever needed. And, and take, it takes as long as it takes for us to feel more comfortable and more in tune with the body. But eventually, when we do get more comfortable and attuned, we'll start to understand the truth behind this line from a poem by Mary Oliver. Let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. We'll begin to realize that actually by simply allowing the body to inform us moment by moment as we make our day by day choices, we'll begin to move in the direction of what the whole system genuinely loves. And this movement will you know, connect us more deeply with the body and connect us with our vitality. And we can support this entire process by being active and learning new things and eating well and you know, taking up breathing exercises and all sorts of stuff that we know supports health and vitality in our day-to-day -day lives, in part by bringing us more in touch with what it means to be a biological organism, to have a human body, to respond to circumstances as they arise with sensations and feelings and thoughts and so on, and beginning to get in touch with what is needed in this moment to move to the next with the greatest purpose. The more we can do that, the more we can live that way, the more we will indeed get in touch with our innate biological and human vitality.